Okay. You ready? There we go. Oh, thank you. Could you? I, 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 could do that. I, I, I thought you were doing the way. I just lost the shoe. <laughs> I moved too fast. I blew a shoe. <laughs> oh, look at what my computer did. It counted to 10. I'm going to count backwards. I'm just that good. Counting by fives, baby. All right, that's pretty cool. Would you agree? Kind of pointless. All right, well, but would you agree that, that computers, the two things they appear to do is make decisions, that was an illusion, and do stuff, a lot of stuff quickly. That's also an illusion, but it's a more real one. And so what we do is we can make the computer do stuff a lot of times. And that turns out to be really handy because computers are good at repetition, right? And so um, there's a couple of ways to manage repetition in a computer, and we're going to look at one of them right now. And this is the notion of what's called a for loop. Let me show you how it works. Okay. Um, Oh, here's something that's kind of interesting. Take a look at this first function, init. You see the init function? What do you suppose that means, init? Initialize. Initialize. A lot of times what I might want to do is have some code that happens before I do everything else. Could that be useful? It could be, and let me tell you one place it might be useful. In all these other programs, I'm going to need access to that output div. And I'm going to have three different functions on here that all need access to the output div. So far, are you following me? How about, rather than me having to write that code every time, I write it once, and then I can just have access to it anywhere else. Wouldn't that be great? So here's what I'm going to do. I have this init function. And in the init function, I'm going to go ahead and get access to that output. And notice that I declared the output here outside of any functions. That means all the functions can have access to it. OK? And now, take a look at my HTML. I've made a tiny little change to the HTML. Body onload gets init. So onload's kind of like on click, but it's not waiting for a click. What's it waiting for? The loading of the web page. So what this says is, after the web page is loaded, I want you to run this function. You see why that's really handy? So a lot of times if I have some initialization I want to do, I'll set body onload gets init. And then I can put any function in a, I can put any code in the init function and that will happen first. That sometimes simplifies my other life. We okay with that little change? Okay. Um, now when you look at the HTML, I just have these buttons. That one counts, that counts backwards, that counts by five. So we can look at those functions and learn something from each of those. Good? Okay, let's look at the, the simplest one, the count. Right here. Okay, what are you seeing? Well, I'll put that in our, in our HTML as blank. That makes sense. Now look at line 18. That's the interesting line, isn't it? There seems to be a lot happening there. Let me show you what's happening. We have a real important variable here. I'm just calling it i, because if you don't have a better name for an integer, I call it i. That's just the tradition. Um, so I got a variable called i. Does that i look pretty important here? Well, I reference it three times in that one line. So yeah. Um, anytime you have a loop, you tend to have what's called a sentry variable. So you have a variable whose value controls access to the loop. It's a sentry, like a guard, non shall die. Yeah. So i, in this case, is my sentry variable. And I've got little three little chunks of code in here. But all of these chunks of code talk about i. And here's what they say about i. The first one says, how does it start? The second one talks about how does it end. And the third thing talks about how does it change. 
That was really important, so I'm going to say it again. When we have a for loop, we're interested in our century variable, and what we need to know is three things. How does it start? How does it end? How does it change? Does that idea make sense to you? Even if you're not, you're a little fuzzy on the syntax right now, if the idea is okay, I'll show you the syntax. So here's how that works. How do you suppose I starts? One. Now this is a little tricky because it's the opposite of how it's end. This is a condition, and as long as the condition is true, we stay here. So that's really how do we stay. I stay in the loop as long as i is less than or equal to 10. So far, are you okay with that? Now this i++ plus plus is a little interesting. Let me show you how that works. Remember, we could say with any variable, heck, I'll do y. We could say this. Man. The marker is betraying me. i gets i plus 1. Is that legal? Yes, it is. But I could shortcut that to i plus equals 1. Is that legal? Sure. That just adds 1 to i. And do you suppose this happens a lot? It does. A lot of times we just want to increment by 1. There's one more neat thing we could do. We could do i plus plus. That's exactly the same as the other two lines. i plus plus is a shorthand for add 1 to i. Okay, here's a pun. When these guys decided to make a better version of C, they called it C++. plus plus. It's one better. And C sharp. Microsoft has never admitted this. C sharp is plus 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 plus. <laughs> Seriously? I've never gotten anybody from Microsoft to actually admit that. But one guy who worked there was just smirked at me when I said, that's how you got to do this. Um, but yeah, so this is one more. Um, so that's what's going on with this I++. Plus plus. We're adding one to it. So what's going to happen to I is that this for statement sets up a loop. For loops are useful when you know how many times something's going to happen. And so they're pretty handy. Um, and what's going to happen in this loop? On the first pass, i is going to be 1. Then it's going to check and say, hey, i, are you less than or equal to 10? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, well, then stay here. We do some work. In this case, all we're going to do is add the value of i to some output. And then the end for pops back up, add 1 to i, check the condition. Are you still less than or equal to 10? Why, yes, I am. Okay, let's do it again. Until eventually, it is larger than 10, and we'll get out of the loop. Does that make sense? Let's watch it in action and see what it's doing. Oh, I know, that wasn't very exciting. We'll come back to one of these others so we can see it. Count to 10. That was too fast to really appreciate it, wasn't it? Wouldn't it be cool... If we could do, you know, like when you're watching like uh, sports and stuff, and something crazy happens, and you don't really get it, what do they do? Slow -mo. Super slow-mo. Different angles, they look at it from different <coughs> angles, and you can see what's going on, and then you can endlessly argue about how stupid the refs are and stuff. Wouldn't it be cool if in your programming we could do super slow-mo? Yeah. Of course you can, that's what I'm about to show you. Yeah, that would be really cool, and it's really sometimes very, very helpful. And it all comes from that magical F12 key again. Show you how it's done. Um, wow, I have messed things up because I have it so small for you. Um, you need to go to the sources menu. You did that. Okay. I did it here because I have things bumped up so you can see it better. When you go to the sources menu, you can look at the actual code of a page, and we've done that before. This is not a helpful tab, you go away. Thank you. And now, what I want to do is watch this. When I right click on a line, I can add what's called a breakpoint. OK. 
Okay, and that doesn't seem like it makes a big difference, but you notice there's a little highlight here on the 17. Okay, now when I run this thing again, and I hit the count to 10, paused in debugger, it stopped it. And notice something interesting. What's highlighted, where are we? Over here. Line 17. It means it's about to run that. When I put that breakpoint in, what I said is, next time I run, I want you to run full speed to get to that line, then just stop and wait for me. So it's paused, and we can take a look at what's going on. That's kind of awesome, isn't it? So now that we're paused, we have some other things that we can do. Um, we can step, I'm going to step over next function. So now when I did that little step command, so I did that little, I don't know, that jump over thing. I'm right here. See where I am on the screen? Sorry, I can't. You can drag it up. Are you at the bottom of the screen? Yeah. If, right there. If you hover over, you can, there you go, it's So that means step over, and you can see because it says step over. And now what it did is it then moved me to line 17. And that's super interesting. And now what that means is line 18 is about to happen. It hasn't happened yet. But here's something interesting. When I hover over the I, it says, I don't know what that means yet. That's because this line hasn't happened yet, but it's about to. Does that make sense? And then I can say, um, step again. And then it's moving to this line. Now, here's the interesting thing. If I hover over I again, come on. Oh, there it is. If I hover, hover over I again, it should tell me its value, and it's... Yeah, it was there. It was there. It was there. Yeah. There it is. One. I's value is one. How neat is that? And what's really fun is I can step a few times. And as I'm stepping, I can keep looking at I. And it'll tell me its value. Why might that be really handy? You can see how many times it's going. What we're going to find is sometimes when we write loops, we end up writing loops that don't end properly. Or there's already been times in our coding we've seen where something is not what you thought it was, right? Well, this debugger is a marvelous way to say, stop the train. I'm going to go in there in slow motion. I'm going to look around. And as it's running, I'm going to look at all these variables and make sure they have the values that I want them to have. And so a debugger is just a marvelous tool for checking your logic. And, and the reason we didn't really cover it yet is because you've now discovered there's two distinctive kinds of things that go wrong, right? The first one is, it just crashes, right? Something spectacular happens. Now, the good news about that is you get an error message, and we can often decode the error message and figure out what it was. What's worse is, it seems to be working fine, but it isn't exactly. And those are much harder to work with, aren't they? When there's no error, but you know it's not right, that's much harder. That's when the debugger can be real handy. Like for a couple of you, we got places where you thought you were clicking on the button that was going to a function, but it wasn't. And so we could use the debugger to test that. Am I really going to this function? Aha. Uh -huh. Or I'm going to the function, it's not doing what I want it to do. Um, and also, especially in the case of loops, where the speed of a computer is such but you can't even tell it's in a looping structure, can you? It goes so fast. Because all of that 10 happened in a fraction of a second. A um, 1,000 would happen in a fraction of a second. Um, this allows us to slow it down to a human pace so we can watch and see what's going on and make sure our logic is really doing what we want it to do. Could that be very useful in your life? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's keep doing this and watch what happens. Um, Here's another neat thing that, that you can do. Um, you can actually look at all the variables it currently knows about, which is a lot. But the only one I'm interested in is this i. 
And as we step through this thing, I's value is going to change, and we can see it. Although it's too much of a pain to look at it, we could do it this way. Watch I. So I'm telling, hey, tell me what's up with I. And then every time I do another step, it's telling me the current value of I. It got to 11, and then it stopped. Does that surprise us? No, that's what we wanted. As soon as it got larger than or equal to 10, it said no more. So that's pretty exciting news. Would you agree? Now the step out says I'm done with the function. This says go ahead and finish it. But often what I'll just do is get the heck out. Oh, we're in a weird place. I don't want to be there. So then you can turn off the breakpoint and run it at regular speed by just re rerunning it. So does that notion of the debugger, can you see when that could be really, really useful? And here's the crazy thing. You've had this F12 key in your browser all this time. You had no idea. That thing has been there all this time, and you can do some crazy things. You, could I debug somebody else's code? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could run Google's code through the debugger. I can't change it, not permanently. Yeah, I can debug that code. Okay, so you're okay with counting by ones? Okay, how do you think this one works? Do you think we still have an I? Sure. How's it start? 10. 10. How's it end? Or at least, how does it continue? Zero. Well, that's how it changes. How does it continue? It's a condition. As long as it's larger than zero, it continues. And then how does it change? It goes down. It goes down, and you'd be very clever if you thought if plus plus adds one, maybe minus minus subtracts one. Does it? It does. So the counting backwards is going to be very similar. Okay, let's look at the code. 